Welcome to this episode of the Voice of Victory podcast, recorded live at the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We hope the message today from Pastor Chris Nolan is a blessing to you. Before you begin listening, I invite you to grab your Bible and follow along. Now, let's join Pastor Chris. Amen. This is Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jason and choir. Wasn't that good? I tell you, if I can't preach after that, then something's wrong. Amen. I might as well just, just hang it up, right? Uh, that's good stuff. Praise the Lord. This is Jesus. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's alive and well. And guess what? One day he's coming back to take us home. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that trumpet sounding. Uh, like that old preacher used to say, we need to keep our eyes on the sky, but our hands on the plow. Amen. Keep serving the Lord uh, while we wait for his soon return because Jesus our King is coming again one day, and what a day that's going to be, amen? If you take your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, and as you turn there, let me just say once again, thank you. Uh, thank you for accepting and loving me and my family and making us feel at home here at Victory Baptist Church. Uh, I want to say thank you to Brother Rick and the pastor search team who did a Excellent job through the entire process of, of getting us here. Um, I'm thankful for all those who made our move uh, and transition so easy. And uh, thank you for Brother Norm. I got to stay at his house the other night and uh, had uh, dinner and breakfast with him. Got to know him a little bit. Uh, and all of our staff. I mean, let me tell you something. These guys are awesome. Uh, I had lunch uh, this past week with Brother Kyle, and he and I batted around some ideas for children's ministry, and I tell you what, good things are coming, amen, and uh, God's going to do a mighty work in this place. I'm believing that, and I hope you are too, and so uh, I appreciate Brother Todd, Brother Jason, Brother Kyle, and uh, Brother Judd, and all those that just keeps the, 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 the wheels rolling here at Victory Baptist Church, and so we're just expecting great things. But uh, this morning, we want to look at Philippians chapter 1. That is our text for this morning. We're beginning a series of messages uh, through the book of Philippians. We're going to go verse by verse uh, studying this wonderful book, one of Paul's prison epistles. He wrote this book while in prison in Rome uh, to the church at Philippi. And so Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 is our text for this morning. The Word of God says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meant for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to this very important time of our gathering today, the preaching of the Word of God, Father, we pray that you would fill us with your Spirit, that you would grant us wisdom and understanding. Father, that we would be encouraged, that we would be equipped through the preaching of your Word today. Father, we pray that your word would not return void, but we ask that it would accomplish what you desire for it to accomplish in our hearts and lives this morning, and we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the book of Philippians was written around A.D. 61 or 62 by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
the Philippian letter that Paul is writing here to the Philippians is to the church at Philippi during the time in which Paul was imprisoned in Rome. Now, Paul had visited Philippi on his second missionary journey, and while there, there were many people that trusted in Christ as their Savior. Some of those people uh, you may recognize, such as Lydia and her family, and also the Philippian jailer that we read about in the book of Acts, and his family was saved during Paul's missionary journey there at Philippi. It is also believed that Epiroditus may have been the pastor at the church at Philippi, and he was sent by the church with some financial gifts in order to encourage and to help Paul while he was in prison there in Rome. Now, this church, the church at Philippi, was a very loving church, a very giving church. Uh, And this love that they had for Paul compelled Paul to write this letter to the Philippian church to encourage them, to thank them for their gifts, but also to give them instructions in living the Christian life. Now, the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. As a matter of fact, the word joy is used many times throughout the book of Philippians, more so than most any other book in the Bible. So the theme is joy, and it's all about the joy of living for the Lord, the joy of growing in Him, the joy of serving Him. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. It is the joy of the Lord that gives us strength to live the Christian life in a hostile world. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, this morning we're going to focus on the joy of growing together. The joy of growing together. Now, by way of introduction, as we look at this this morning, it needs to be understood that as a church... We are one family serving one God, amen? Therefore, we have one purpose, and unity is found in growing together as one organism, as one body, as we grow together in this joy that we have in the Lord. You see, when it comes to the church, the church is not to be fragmented with different ministries and different groups and everybody just doing their own thing. We need to understand this morning that we are one church. We are one family. Victory Baptist Church is not many different little churches uh, to make one big church. No, we are one church. We are one family. And every ministry of this church ties together. Every ministry of this church feeds on one another. We are one family. We have one purpose. We have one vision, and that's to reach Mount Juliet with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that. And as we grow together as a church family, there is a joy that is beyond comparison. There is a joy that is beyond anything that we can imagine as we experience that growth together. As we look here in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, there are several things that we see here. The first thing we see is that Paul is thankful for the fellowship of the gospel. He is thankful for the fellowship of the gospel. If you notice there in verses 1 through 5, we have this this introduction into the book. Paul identifies himself as the writer of the book, along with Timotheus and the servants of Jesus Christ, and he's writing to all the saints that are there at Philippi. And notice he says he thanks God for every remembrance of them. He is thankful for the time that he spent with them, and he is also thankful for the gifts that they have supplied for Paul while he was in that prison in Rome. But notice he says in verses 4 and 5, he says he is praying always in every prayer of mine from the, of, of making all requests with joy. Now look at verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now for your fellowship that is in the gospel. Now notice that phrase where he says from the first day until now. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, that basically means this, is that the fellowship of the gospel began the moment that they accepted Christ as their Savior. And so Paul is saying that the very moment that they received Jesus as their Savior, they entered into this fellowship of the gospel, and it has continued all the way till today. Now, we must ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to have this fellowship? What is the word fellowship? Well, the word fellowship basically means partnership. So you see, the church at Philippi had a partnership in the gospel that began the very moment that they came to faith in him. You see, when you came to faith in Jesus and you trusted Christ as your Savior, in that moment, you were baptized in the Holy Ghost, you were indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you were birthed into the family of God, adopted into his family, and you began this fellowship of the gospel, this partnership of the gospel. Did you know that you are a a part of a family of God that stretches all over this world? Think about that. Uh, Believers all around the world, just like you and I, that are worshiping him here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Think about that. We have a partnership together. And everywhere we go, all around the world, when we meet other believers, we are partners together in the gospel. We are partnering together to bring the gospel to the world, but also to grow in the gospel together, to live out the gospel together. We have this fellowship in the gospel that started the very moment that we believed. You see, the joy of growing together begins with this partnership. Because you see, church, it's all about the gospel. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's not just about Victory Baptist Church, but it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is what unites us. The gospel is what we believe in. The gospel is what we preach. The gospel is what we teach. The gospel is what we live. And you and I cannot experience the joy of growing together unless we have the fellowship of the gospel. And so, church, I'm here to tell you this morning, here in 2024, this is my goal. And that is to simply make the main thing the main thing. Amen? Uh, It's not about building our own little kingdoms. It's simply about promoting the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the one thing that we can agree on. That is the one thing that we can unite on. And so let's not focus on all the things that we may disagree on. Because by the way, anytime you get a group of people together, you're going to find something you disagree on. Amen? Uh, Matter of fact, all it takes is two people. You get two people alone in a room, and they start having discussions with one another. I don't care who it is. Sometime along the way, they're going to disagree on something, right? I mean, that's just our human nature. And so here's the thing. In 2024, let's not focus on those things that that may divide us or those things that we may disagree on or those things that we may not understand. Let's just simply focus on what we know is true, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let that be our vision. Let that be our focus. Let us unite around that and around the purpose of bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world because it's the gospel that brings us together. And so Paul was thankful for that fellowship of the gospel, that partnership in the gospel. But then there's a second thing that Paul was thankful for, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. And that is that Paul was thankful for the growth in the gospel. He was thankful for the growth in the gospel. Paul expresses thanksgiving not only for the fellowship of the gospel, but also for the growth of the gospel. You see, you need to understand this morning that the gospel is not something you graduate from. In other words, it's not just a one-time thing. The gospel is not just something that you believed in when you accepted Christ as your Savior. As believers in Christ, we are to not only know the gospel, but we're also to live the gospel. We're to live out the gospel in our daily lives. And so therefore, it is something that we don't just simply believe in, but it is something that we must grow in. We never graduate from the gospel. We are to grow in the gospel and we're to live out the gospel in our daily lives. Now, as we do this, there are several things that takes place and these are important. I would encourage you to to write these down. They'll be helpful to you. They'll encourage you this morning. These are the things that happens when we grow in the gospel together. The first thing that we could be assured of is found in verse number six, and that is the simple fact that God finishes 
what he starts. God finishes what he starts. Look at what it says in verse 6. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Warren Wearsby wrote this. He says it was a source of joy to Paul to know that God was still working in the lives of his fellow believers at Philippi. After all, this is the real basis for joyful Christian fellowship to have God at work in our lives day by day. Aren't you glad that God is still working on you? Amen. Uh, I love that little children's song that we sing sometime. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How lovingly and patiently he must be. He's still working on me. I I am glad that when I came to know Christ as my Savior, that God did not leave me hanging. God did not leave me to fend for myself. God did not just leave me there. He is still working on me. And when I mess up and when I sin and I make a mess of things, God never gives up on me. Amen. He keeps working on me and he is molding me and he is shaping me to one day to be just like Jesus. This is what we call progressive sanctification. God working in our lives, through the circumstances of our lives, through the experiences of our lives, through the study of his word, through other people that God brings into our lives, God is using all those things in order to grow us and to mold us and to shape us to be just like Jesus. Which, by the way, one day that's going to happen, amen? There's going to come a day when you and I are going to be glorified and we're going to be made to be just like Jesus. How do we know that? Because Romans chapter 8 tells us that God has predestined it to be so. Amen. God has predetermined that everyone who puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will one day be in the image of Jesus Christ, conform to his image. One day we will be just like him. One day we will be holy as he is holy. Amen. And all about you, but I am looking forward to that day. But in the meantime, God is preparing me for that day. And he is progressively sanctifying me. He is molding me. He is shaping me to make me to be more and more like Jesus. And according to what Paul says here in Philippians 1 and verse number 6, you and I can be confident that as we allow him to mold us, he will finish what he starts. I am glad that God finishes what he starts, amen? He has started a work in me, and he's not going to give up on that work. He's going to finish what he starts. You know, how many times in our lives do we start a project? And then we never finish it, amen? Uh, I'm horrible about that, especially around the house. You know, there'll be things that my wife wants me to do, and uh, I may start on it. And, uh, and I get tired of it or, or something doesn't go right. And I think, well, I, I'll just, I, I'll take care of that later. And, and then it's left there halfway done. And then the next thing I know, I start another project. And then that's left there halfway done. And then nothing ever gets done that way. I'm glad that God doesn't do that with us, amen? He he doesn't just start something in us and just leave it alone. No, he finishes what he starts. We can be confident of this very thing, Paul says, that he which hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will finish what he starts. And so as we grow in the gospel together, we need to understand that God is going to finish it. It is God's work, and he is working in us, molding us, and shaping us to be just like Jesus. God finishes what he starts. There's another thing that happens as we grow in the gospel. Verse number 7, we see that we are partakers of grace. We are partakers of grace. Notice verse 7. He says, Even as it is meant for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. You see, Paul had a strong connection with the church at Philippi as partners in the gospel, partaking in the grace of God. I believe it was the assistance that Paul received from the church that gave him such confidence that this church was true partners in his ministry. 
And this partnership, this connection, was founded in the grace of God. Paul could not endure the chains that he was in in Rome if it were not for the grace of God and for the church that would carry out the work while Paul was still there in prison. It was the grace of God that carried him through. Now, what is the grace of God? Where the word grace basically means God's unmerited favor. It is God giving to us what we do not deserve. It is God giving us grace. He's giving us favor, even though we do not deserve that. You see, you and I are saved by grace. We know that in the book of Ephesians, it says it is by grace that we are saved through faith. And it is not of ourselves, but it is a gift of God. There is absolutely nothing that you or I can do to save ourselves. There is nothing that you and I can do to be good enough to get to heaven. It is a free gift given to us by God. It is grace. It is God's unmerited favor. But not only are we saved by grace, but also we live by grace. And Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18 that we are to do what? We are to grow in grace. We are to grow in God's unmerited favor. We are to grow in his favor for, on our lives. In other words, our goal in life should be to glorify him in such a way that his favor upon us increases. We're, we need to grow in that grace, that unmerited favor, that God would be pleased with us, that God would take joy in us, that, that God would, 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 be, would be glad of on, on how we live and how we serve him, that he would give us more of his grace each and every day. We're to grow in that grace. And as we grow in the Lord, we experience more of that undeserved favor of that wonderful grace grace that he's given to us. Now, it may be kind of strange to us because Paul here understood his imprisonment as part of God's favor on his life. Think about that. I mean, if you're in prison, would you think that God had favor on you? Uh, if you were in prison, would you think that, well, I'm experiencing the grace of God? Well, Paul did. Paul was there in those chains, and he said that he was partakers of God's grace. In other words, he looked at his sufferings as God having grace upon him. He counted a joy to suffer for Christ because he looked at it as God's grace being bestowed upon him. You see, as we grow together in the gospel as a church, we should embrace whatever that process of growth looks like, and we should embrace God's favor in whatever form such grace is bestowed upon us. In other words, as we grow together, we may, we may go through some tough times. As we grow together, we may go through some difficult days. As we grow together, there may be some rocky roads. But you know what? That's all a part of God's grace that is working in us and working on us to, for him to finish the work that he has started in us. Amen? It's all a part of his grace. So whatever we go through as a church family, we need to embrace those things and, and remember that, hey, God is doing something. And God is going to use those moments and those difficult times or whatever it may be in order to grow us, to make us stronger because God's got an amazing plan and purpose for our lives and for our church. And so therefore we need to grow in that grace. And so whatever that process of growth looks like, we need to embrace it, understanding that it's the grace of God that is upon us. Why? Because we are partakers of his grace. And so we grow in the gospel together, and as we grow, we are partakers of his grace. But then there's another thing in verses 8 through 9. We see that as we grow in the gospel together, our love grows. Our love grows. Notice verse 8 and 9. He says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, look at this, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. You see, Paul had a great love for the saints at Philippi. He loved them with the same love that Christ had for them. Uh, one commentator said this, he said the emphasis 
is upon the similarity of his affections to Christ's, and therefore this clause may be rendered as a lo- I love you in the same way that Christ Jesus himself loves you. Now let me ask you something. Do you love the person sitting next to you or the person on the other side of the sanctuary this morning? Do you love that person the same way that Jesus loves you? Think about that. That This love that Paul had for the church led him to pray that their love would abound. And this love is the key, he says, to true knowledge and judgment and a life of holiness. You see, as we grow in the gospel, our love for one another should abound more and more. It should grow deeper. The church is to be filled with the love of Christ. And as we are filled with his love, what happens? Our love for one another grows. And as our love for one another grows, so does our care for one another. And as our care for one another grows, so does our holiness grow. Think about that. It's all about the love of Christ. You see, the closer we are to the Lord and the closer we are to one another, the greater discernment that we will have pertaining to living a godly life and living in obedience to God's plan and God's purpose. And so we need to abound, we need to grow in the love of Christ. You know, in the book of 1 John, it tells us this. It says that that if you do not have love for your brothers or sisters in Christ... Then he says, you are none of his. In other words, the true mark of a true believer is the love that we have for one another. If we don't have love for one another, then, hey, we need to check up on our salvation. You know, we need to make sure that we're really saved. Because if you're really saved, then you're going to love other believers in Christ. Even when there are differences. Even when there are different views and different opinions, we are to love them. Think about that. Do you love that brother or sister that looks at things different than you do? Do you love that brother or sister in Christ that maybe they have some different theological viewpoints than you have or they uh, attend a church of another denomination? Do you love them with the love of Christ? Do you love them the way Jesus loves loves them? Uh, Do you love one another as a church family here at Victory Baptist the way Jesus loves loves us. Hey, we may have differences of opinion. You know, some people like one style of music and other people like different styles of music. Some people think we ought to dress a certain way and other people we ought to dress another way. And some people think we ought to do this particular ministry. And some people think, well, maybe we ought to do this ministry. And so we all have these different ideas and opinions. But remember, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's the love of God that brings us together and that unites us. And it doesn't matter what our difference are, the question is, do we really love each other? Amen? Do we really love each other? Do we care for one another? Are we growing in the love of Christ? You see, as we grow in the gospel together, our love for one another is going to grow. And this love that we have in Christ overshadows everything. It goes beyond our differences. It wipes away our sins. It brings us together in one mind, in one purpose, in one mission. It is the love of God that unites us. It is the love of God that holds us together. It is the love of God that compels us to press on despite our troubles and our flaws. It's the love of God that is the glue that holds us together as a church. And so therefore we've got to learn to love one another. And so we grow in the gospel together, and as we grow in the gospel together, our love is going to abound more and more. Our love is going to grow. But then there's another thing in verse number 10. Not only is our love going to grow, but as we grow in the gospel together, our holiness will develop. Our holiness will develop. Notice verse number 10. He says that you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. You see, Paul's desire for the church is that they would be holy. You see, I believe that's the problem with churches across America today, is we've got away from living holy lives. Uh, There's too much of the world in us. 
uh, we're, we're too affected by the world. We, we've adopted the world's ways. The scripture says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by renewing our minds to the word of God. In other words, we're not to start looking like the world and acting like the world and talking like the world. We're to try to become more like Jesus. That's the goal. The goal is not to become more relevant. The goal is not to become more like everybody else. The goal is to become more like Jesus. Amen. Uh, it's not about changing who we are in order to, 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 to reach people for Christ or whatever it may be. It's about becoming more like Jesus. The more we're like Jesus, the more we're going to reach people for him. Amen. It's all about growing in holiness. We need to be a church that is holy. And that is what Paul desired for the church there at Philippi is that they would be holy. But here's the thing. A holy life comes from having a relationship with Christ and with others. That's how we become holy. The Bible knowledge commentator says this. It says, Paul wanted his readers to be rightly related to God and in fellowship with him. Paul was also concerned that their relationships with others be what God would have them to be. Now, I want you to understand something very clearly this morning. This is important. You need to hear this. And that is the fact that you cannot say that you are right with God if you are not right with others. And you cannot say that you are right with others if you are not right with others. And you cannot say that you are holy if you are not right with God and right with others. You see, holiness begins with a relationship. It's not just about being pure or being separated from the world. Purity and right living are natural byproducts of right relationships. So it begins with your relationship with God, and you cannot be holy apart from Him. Holiness develops and grows in our relationship with others. Therefore, you cannot be holy if you're not right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about that. You see, if your vertical relationship with God is not right, then your horizontal relationship with others is not going to be right. And if your horizontal relationship with others is not right, then your vertical relationship with God's not going to be right. So in other words, if we're not right with God and with each other, then we cannot say that we're a holy church. Amen? Uh, If we're not right with God and right with each other, we cannot say that we are living a holy life. We need to get things right with Him, and we need to get things right with each other if we're going to be the church that God wants us to be. Amen? In 2024. I believe that God wants to do an amazing work in this place. I believe that God wants to send a great revival. I believe that 2024 could be a a tremendous year where God is going to do a a great work. It can be the beginning of, of great things and great growth here at Victory Baptist Church. But in order to get to that point, in order for God to do what he wants to do in this place, then we ourselves must be right with God and right with each other. Amen? Maybe you say, well, pastor, I think I'm right with God. Are you really? Think about that. Is there somebody in this church that you have not talked to in weeks or months or years because of some disagreement you had with them in the past? Is there somebody in this church that when you walk down the hall and you pass each other, you never say anything to one another, you never greet any, one another, you never smile at one another because of some disagreement that you have with one another? Let me tell you something. Don't tell me you're right with God if you cannot look your brother and sister in the face and give them a hug around the neck and love on them and tell them that you love them in the Lord. If you can't do that, then you're not right with God. Amen? And so if you're going to be right with God, you've got to be right with each other. And if you're going to be right with each other, you've got to be right with God. The two go together. And you cannot say that you're holy unless you do that. And in order for God to bless his church, then we've got to be holy. Amen? And so it all, it's just a circle. It all just comes around. If we want God to bless, we've got to be holy. If we want to be holy, we've got to be right with him. And we've got to be right with each other. Being right with God and with one another produces a holy life, which, by the way, in turn causes our faith to be known to the unbelieving world as we are known by our love for one another. If we want to reach the lost in Mount Juliet with the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
then Victory Baptist Church must be a church that is known for their love for one another. We can't expect people to get saved if we don't treat each other right, amen? We can't expect people to get saved if we don't have a love for one another. How can we say we love the lost world if we don't love our own family? Think about that. And so we've got, to, we've got to grow in that love and in that holiness. And it is as we grow deeper in the gospel that our relationship with God and others is strengthened and our holiness then develops. And so we need to grow in this gospel, the joy of growing together. Notice as we grow in the gospel together, we need to understand that as we grow... That, uh, uh, that, that our God will finish what he starts. We are partakers of his grace. Our love is going to grow. Our holiness is going to develop. But then there's a final thing in verse number 11. As we grow in the gospel together, we are filled with the evidence of righteousness. We are filled with the evidence of righteousness. Notice verse 11. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now, the fruits of righteousness is the results of a holy life. So as we live as we should, and we serve him as he leads us, it will result in great fruit. So the bottom line is the church cannot and will not experience growth if we are not growing in the gospel together. Now, now your pastor and your staff, we can come up with all kinds of ideas and ways to help grow the church. We, we can revamp and revive and breathe life into our children's ministry and our youth ministry and our ministry to young families to, to try to reach young families and get people here. And man, we can work hard and we can roll up our sleeves and we can work our fingers to the bone to, to do all those different things to make the church conducive for growth, which is very important. But here's the thing. If we're not growing in the gospel together then all of that work is for nothing, amen? Uh, if we're not becoming more holy, then all that work is for nothing. If we're not right with God and right with each other, then all of that work is for nothing because we're not going to experience the fruits of righteousness unless we are righteous, amen? We're not gonna have God's favor upon us and we're not gonna see growth and we're not gonna reach more people unless we are living the lives that God would have us to live. The church cannot and will not experience growth if we are not growing in the gospel together. So you see, the key this morning is to be right with God and right with each other. Only then can we be holy and we can see the fruit of God continuing his work through us. So in conclusion this morning, let me encourage you with this. The church cannot grow if we are divided. We must grow together in the gospel so that we may experience God's favor as he continues his work on us and in us, then and only then can we bear much fruit. Amen? You see, I believe that God wants to do a great work. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. Amen? Uh, I came here to Victory Baptist Church because I believe that God has his hand on this place. I believe that God wants to work miracles through Victory Baptist Church. I believe that God wants to, to bring families that have been broken apart. He wants to bring them together again. I believe that God wants to bring healing to those who are sick. God wants to save those who are lost. God wants to do an amazing work in Mount Juliet, Tennessee through Victory Baptist Church. But how's it going to start? On this first Sunday of a new year, how does it start? It starts on our knees. It starts by getting right with God and getting right with each other. It starts by getting on the same page, understanding that what unites us is the gospel, understanding that we are partners in the gospel. And as we grow together in that, then we will see God do some miraculous things in this place. So my question for you is simply this this morning. Will you join us in that? Amen. Will you get on board? Whatever has happened in the past, 
Whatever you went through in 2023 in your life personally or as a church, whatever struggles, whatever problems, let me tell you something. It's a clean slate. Just wipe it all away. Let's get on our knees today. Let's cry out to God. Let's ask him to forgive us. Let's ask him to cleanse us. Let's get focused on the gospel and let's see God do some miraculous things in this place this year. Amen. And I believe that he can do it. I encourage you to stand this morning with your head bowed and your eyes closed and Brother Jason will come and lead us in an invitational hymn. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you something, you've come to the right place. Because there are people here that love you, that care about you, and more than anything else, we want you to know that you're saved and that you're on your way to heaven. Because you see, when all is said and done, the only thing that matters is what you have done with Jesus. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you know that you know that you know that you're on your way to heaven? I heard an old preacher say one time that if you're 99% sure that you're saved, you're 100% lost. The Bible says that you can know that you're saved beyond any shadow of a doubt. Do you know that you're going to heaven this morning? Uh, Brother Todd is going to be here in the front. Brother Judd's going to be here. And If you're here today and you never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, we encourage you to come. Take Brother Todd or Brother uh, uh, Judd by the hand and they'll lead you to someone who who is trained, equipped, and ready to take a Bible and show you how to be saved and how you can know it. Maybe you're here as a member of this church and you just want to make a fresh commitment that in 2024, hey, you want to be holy. You want to be right with God. You want to be right with each other. You want to see God do a great work in this place. The altar is open. You come, you kneel, you come and do business with God today. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do, you be obedient to his nudge, to his call upon your life this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for how you have equipped us. We thank you for how you have taught us, how you've challenged us. But, oh God, we thank you for how you have convicted us. Because, God, we want to be obedient to you. We want to be pleasing to you, and we want to see you do some great things in this place in the years to come. But, Father, our hearts have got to be right with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our failures. Forgive us of all the things that we've done in selfishness and in pride and whatever it may be. Lord, would you remove all of that from our lives? Lord, would you cleanse us? Would you make us whole? Would you make us new? Would you give us a clean slate? Would you give us a fresh start here on this first Sunday of a new year? And God, may you do miraculous things in this place. Father, we pray for that one, two, three, or four here today that that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. Father, we pray that you would convict them, that you would open their hearts, their minds to be receptive to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Help them to know that Jesus loves them and that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for their sins. Help them to know that the only way in which their sins can be forgiven, the only way they can be reconciled to God is by faith in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, help them to put that faith and that trust in you today before it's eternally too late. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. As, you, as we sing, the altar is open. You come. Do business with God this morning. We hope you've been blessed by this week's message and invite you to join us soon in person on the Victory Campus. Worship schedules and other information can be found on our website at bbcmtj.org. Please visit it today. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.